welcome to the pseudo show. This is Brandon. Just a little bit of housekeeping. This episode is supposed to go out before the new year. So it's about a week late, but better late than ever, especially better uh, this week than next week. In this episode, Bill, Neil, and I got together to just talk about our thoughts on 2022 and what we're hopeful for in 2023. It's a bit of a long episode. I did my best to edit out some of our tangents, but then I decided to leave some of them in. There are a couple that I may release as an extras episode. I thought were pretty funny, so you may see that later this month. But for now, here is 2022, a year in review, episode 59. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show. Bill, no, it's so good to see you. I hope you guys have had a good holiday. Yep, certainly quite fun. Had a great holiday. Bill, get the barbecue going. I know I did. I did. I uh, took my charcoal grill the little Weber kettle grill with some charcoal and uh, material to light it off and some steaks and had a wonderful meal with my wife, my mother-in-law and some other family. Enjoyed a cold but sunny day outside and had a, had a great time. You grilled outside in, in 20 degree weather? This is what New Englanders do. We do not care what temperature it is. We are still out grilling. I don't know how I, I don't know how to function this way. <laughs> I smoked a prime rib and it was about 20 degrees. It was great. <laughs> so next year, the pseudo show will be at Brandon's house enjoying a prime rib. <laughs> I mean, as long as he pays for my ticket. Sure. <laughs> we'll All right. We'll see about that. I haven't actually been out there in a long, long time. One of the things that we wanted to talk about in this show was just kind of review the year and uh, kind of look forward into next year. And one of the things that I thought was great, uh, I know Neil went to a few conferences. I was invited to go to a couple, but I ended up not going to them. And that's the return of a tech of the tech conferences. I am personally super happy about this because it's been great to see people again. I went to Scale. I went to the Open SUSE conference. I went to Academy. It was uh, it was fantastic. In person conferences are great because it gives people a chance to connect on a level that I feel isn't really possible, really any other way. Or at least I haven't experienced in the last two years of doing virtual conferences. It just hasn't been the same. Going into next year, I know we have tons. I'm going to be going. I'm likely going to go to Red Hat Summit and Scale. But one of the uh, conferences I hope comes back, it's a smaller Linux conf- open source conference called the Open West that is typically in Utah. Uh, the last one was in 2019. And I, I'm hoping uh, that that will come back this year. And I'll have to figure out a way to get you guys out there for it. Well, we could do a pseudo show thing and you could just use that as an excuse to drag your butts there. Exactly. I'm game. Let's go. Hopefully that comes back. And if it does, uh, we'll figure that one out. A lot of these conferences, what I, what I've been missing is just networking with everyone, getting together with people who are my friends, even though they are peers, but they are my friends. And it's just been, it's going to be good to really start reconnecting with people. I haven't physically seen in uh, two, three years at this point, Neil and I are excited that tech conferences are coming back. Bill, what was your big thing for this year for you? What was the thing that really got you excited? Well, unfortunately, I did not get to go to any tech conferences due to my ankle injury. So I spent most of my year rehabbing and learning how to walk properly again. I'm I'm hoping I get to attend some of those same conferences with you guys. But I think one of the things that I really appreciated the most this year were 
some small improvements to existing projects. And the one that kind of spoke to me the most was the fact that I can now use Cockpit to build not just containers in Podman, but full-blown pods. A little change like that makes such a big impact on someone like me who's trying to explain the simple concepts of containerization and pods to people I interact with every day. And the fact that it's now that I can use a great tool like Cockpit that I already use and already show people to say, this is how you can advance now to the next step in containerization of your applications by creating pods and, in, and then interacting or interfacing that with Kubernetes. I feel like that to me is a tool that I'll use every day that I didn't have before. One of the things that I think is really, really neat about Podman as a developer tool, especially some, especially if you're utilizing Kubernetes a lot, is instead of trying to get Docker Compose files to work inside of Podman through uh, using a, essentially a symlink into to Docker. Uh, you can run Kubernetes YAML directly with Podman. And what I'd love to see next year as just a, an improvement is being able to put that Kubernetes YAML directly into cockpit, hit run, and and let it go into Podman. That That's a, a great one, Bill. I, I, it's because it, it has a, lowered that barrier for a lot of people. And in some ways, I Podman desktop is supposed to help solve that. But in some ways, I, I, I just like the simplicity of the cockpit plugin versus uh, Podman desktop. But when, it, when I need the features of Podman desktop, I'm glad it's there. That's actually one of the things I'm very grateful for that came out this year was uh, Podman desktop. Neil, as much as I love talking about containers, I don't want the whole show to turn into a container show. Neil... In terms of open source software that you've gotten to participate in this year, from your point of view, what was the uh, big thing for you? The most exciting thing for me, the big thing for me this year was starting the Fedora Asahi work and starting to work with the upstream Asahi Linux project to integrate the efforts of supporting Apple Silicon Macintosh computers uh, into Fedora Linux. And it's just, it's been exciting working through the process of bringing up this platform and being able to measurably see how things improve at a rapid clip. It's not like the other hardware enablement stuff that I've been part of before where it's so slow and painful and you've got uncooperative people involved in the project and it's just you wish that you were dead because the because it, the because it's just dragging on and you have so many conflicting things. Everybody wants to work together. Everybody wants to make this successful. And when things come up that are like out of my depth, I can easily, you know, ask someone else for help in the upstream Asahi Linux project. And sometimes they'll ask me for stuff. And it's great because we have a really good feedback loop going. And I launched the Asahi Linux, uh, the Fedora Asahi SIG uh, just just quite recently. And I'm, I'm really happy with the progress that we've made. And I'm looking forward to what we're going to um, do in the next year. I, I will say, Neil, when I had the chance to bump into you around Thanksgiving and you showed me that magical laptop running Asahi Fedora. That was, that was pretty cool to see. Oh yeah. No, like I was so proud of that setup because it took several months to get there. But once we got there, things started improving really quickly and it was very, very quickly becoming usable, which was very exciting. With that project, is that doesn't that also include other ARM based so, uh, ARM based solutions, not just Apple Silicon, or or am I uh, confusing other things? Uh, I think you're thinking of the general Fedora ARM stuff, which is all about the different ARM things, and that's done by a different group of people. The uh, Fedora Sahi work is specifically focused on the Apple Silicon bring up with the Apple. Uh, um, M1 and M2 SOCs and bringing up the unique boot setup as well as like the, the graphics and sound and all these other things. We're basically working in tandem with the upstream developers to make sure that the experience is good, not just for them with their upstream platform that they're developing on, but also in a real life full to a wide variety of users 
general Linux distribution platform, and we're ironing out things and shaking out quirks and stuff like that. And we've caught little things here and there that I don't think anyone else would have found until much later in the process and gotten them fixed early on. So I think it's been a, it's been a fantastic success from that angle. Because we don't want to take up the whole show. I have more questions. We're going to have to put a pin in that and we're going to have to revisit that either in January or in or early February. It's, I think that's going to be really interesting, especially over the next year as that evolves. What, what else have you been working on, Neil, that I know there's at least maybe participated in? I don't know if you've participated in the adaptable Linux platform or not. I know you're involved in OpenSUSE somewhat. So I don't know if you're been involved in that at all. Well, I haven't done too much like fingers on the keyboard code type stuff in the adaptable SUSE adaptable Linux platform. Um, I've been helping with guiding the community integration uh, into the SUSE Linux enterprise engineering process, uh, basically extending the same process that I helped create for OpenSUSE Leap, so that there is an avenue in which community feedback gets funneled back into SUSE engineering to help improve the SUSE, uh, SUSE Adaptable Linux platform, or ALP, as everyone calls it, inside of, inside of the OpenSUSE project. And, and one of the big things that we actually wound up doing was taking the community feedback about x86-64 architecture levels. So SUSE originally wanted to do x86-64 v3. But the problem with that is that it invalidates a huge chunk of community-supported platforms. Like... Most of, for example, I don't actually own many computers that have x86-64 v3 or v4 support. I think I have one, but all the rest of my computers are v2 or v1 even. And so I would have been left out in the lurch, and there was a lot more people that would have also been. And so basically, <clears throat> we worked out the compromise to bring ALP down to v2 and have select stuff being built with both v2 and v3 so if you have the hardware you can take advantage of the enhancements from v3 and that was actually i think a big win from the early susa alp development stuff another thing has been working with those teams to figure out what is the prototype going to look like what are the basic mechanics of it so like for example the usage of cockpit and network manager and a lot of these other like common cross-distribution tooling things, those were not necessarily me alone doing anything, but I certainly had a hand in saying, like, this is actually going to be great, not just from a SUSE and an open SUSE community perspective, but also being able to leverage the best of breed technologies that are available across the entire Linux landscape and to make uh, the SUSE and open SUSE platforms an even better choice for, uh, for adopting it. And actually, that reminds me, speaking of best in breed technologies, one thing I personally had a hand in was bringing up SE Linux support up to scratch in OpenSUSE. Um, over the past couple of years, I worked with um, a bunch of folks to bring up the SE Linux support and make it so that it was in first class for originally OpenSUSE MicroOS and OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. I personally run my OpenSUSE Tumbleweed machines with SE Linux enabled rather than AppArmor. And now um, that fed into SUSE Alp, which now uses SE Linux, uh, bringing both enterprise Linux distributions in, in, into alignment in terms of security tooling. And I'm really, really pleased to see that. Also, fun fact, the SE Linux policy in OpenSUSE is derived from the same one used in Fedora. So the two distribution projects share share the SE Linux policy work and contribute to each other. So I think it's a great win for cross-distro security support. And it's phenomenal for me as someone who's in both, both sides of the, of the, of the ecosystem. Uh, just for the listeners that may not know, what's the differentiator for, uh, of adaptable Linux versus say just traditional open SUSE. So the big difference is that it is it is taking OpenSUSE MicroOS, which is the transactional update system built on ButterFS transactional updates, um, to its logical extreme. So it's it's base it's entirely built on that technology stack. You are using um, your containers are on ButterFS storage. You're using um, you're using containerized workloads as the primary out uh, input. For running things on 
OpenSUSE um, ALP rather than on the bare on the bare system. Though OpenSUSE ALP will support both ways of doing things because that's a community thing. I have no insight into whether that's going to be true for SUSE ALP, which will be the whatever becomes the next SUSE Linux enterprise. Nobody tells me anything about that stuff. I don't I don't know, but whatever that's going to be. Maybe they'll be fully only containerized workloads. But like one of the things that's been interesting about it is that they've been taking the opportunity to experiment with how do you containerize different parts of the Linux system and run them. So like there was an experiment some months ago about containerizing GDM. Did not go well, but at least they tried it. And it was interesting to see the what what that looked like. Uh, and stuff like that, you know, that they're they're playing around with like a containerized firewall D, for example. Um, so there's all kinds of little things going on here, um, where it's very clear that the idea of SUSE ALP, at least from the SUSE side, is rethinking how the actual operating system is composed and used. And so I think you'd probably consider it closer along the lines of being an opinionated, uh, a more opinionated platform for running, uh, Linux workloads. Um, whether it's good or bad on the opinionation, on the opinion, on the opinions that they're developing, we'll see because it's really too early to tell. But you know, so far I'm seeing some great progress. And one of the things that's just me personally, I'm super happy about is seeing somebody come up with um, ideas and trying them. Because like I, I think this is one of the things Susa has a really solid engineering prowess, and they don't get a whole lot of opportunity to demonstrate it. Sousa Alp seems to show that they actually do know their stuff and can do it. Um, they just don't talk about it very well. And that's something I, I would like for us to, to maybe do a little bit of coverage on, on that kind of stuff in the next year. Cause I think it's very exciting stuff and it'd be worth, you know, ex peeling back the layers a little bit, so to yeah, speak. It, it's worth exploring. I mean, one of the things I'm looking forward to next year is how silver blue is Fedora and Fedora is going to take the containerization to the next level. Uh, same with core OS, right? It, it's going to be pushed out as a container image, not as a, a onto disc. The, this is the red hat way of approaching it. I think it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. I, I think there's uh, pros and cons to both sides. It doesn't necessarily is whose approach is better, whose approach is uh, not. It I think it's going to be more of what is your use case to, and does it make sense to use it use it in that use case. I think a lot of these new platforms are going to be great for edge. I mean, we're already seeing that with. Uh, Fedora IoT and SUSE Micro OS with what they're doing with uh, K3S for their edge platform. So there, yeah, there's a lot, uh, just a different different approaches to to the same problem. It's just a matter. I think it's going to be a matter of what best fits your use case. Yeah, actually, for the OCI thing, you mentioned how um, you know with Silverblue and, and and Core OS doing the whole thing of using um, containers to, to push layers of the operating system. Actually, SUSE Micro OS supports the same thing. You can encapsulate ButterFS send and receive streams and snapshots and disk images inside of OCI images, and it will transplant them and, and basically take them as payloads to write to disk. So similar concept, different underpinnings, but like we're conceptually arriving at the same at the same train station. Sounds like it. I'm looking forward to seeing how that all pans out over the next year. On the hardware front, this last year has been, I don't know if I want to say it's interesting, but there's been a new hardware focused on Linux that I was not anticipating. I know a few years ago we had Lenovo release ThinkPads with Fedora and really making a stake on putting a offering more of their systems with Linux, which is great. This is a year I uh, finally refreshed my hardware, mostly because <laughs> it was I needed a new laptop and stuff. So the fact that I know it runs Linux, you know, I'm very comfortable purchasing those machines. But, but beyond that, 
now we're this year we got the i think all three of us have them bill steam deck you know what's your thoughts on what that means for the linux ecosystem and what do you hope to see next year with uh with the steam deck well what i really like about the steam deck is that it puts linux in everybody's hands and yes pun intended because literally it is putting linux in everybody's hands from the way that it's built to to the kind of hardware that went into the steam deck you can tell that a lot of careful planning went into how do we make this work linux first and everything else later what i think this does is it puts amd gpus in a much brighter spotlight it puts the idea of proprietary game consoles on notice saying hey look there's a viable competitor out there and there's a much bigger library of games that people already own that are now available on that handheld device and i will tell you that that steam deck is going to come with me when i have to fly for work and it's going to be my in-flight entertainment system if i really want to get crafty i'll also use it as my work machine because one of the first things that i did was plug it into my Dell USB-C dock on three monitors, keyboard, mouse, and all the other accoutrements that I have. And lo and behold, everything worked. And I I just sat there staring at it for a good 10 minutes, wondering how I have this little handheld device that's basically a full-blown computer gaming console with working thumbsticks that don't feel cheap and chintzy, where I have access to all of my games literally at my fingertips. Yes, pun intended. I am looking forward to seeing what the second gen Steam Deck is like, even if it's not that much of a difference, because I feel like a device like this makes people think about Linux in some sort of way. Whether you love it or you hate it, it makes you realize that Linux is so approachable because gaming is such a huge part of the computer use market. And Brandon, I know you've talked about how many billions of dollars per year is spent in the gaming industry. And now Linux gets to have a bigger piece of that pie. You you brought up uh, extensive library. I think uh, as more games get validated, I'm not going to use the word certified because that has a lot of uh, implications, but validated on Proton, it's going to make Linux a more compelling platform in general. It, It reminds me of the old days when in 2005 ish with Sedega and Code Weavers when they were really making huge inroads with wine and the the flagship game at the time that was really shown off to show that gaming was viable on Linux was World of Warcraft and World of Warcraft performed better on Linux under one of the wine derivatives like whether that was crossover or with Sedega it performed better on Linux uh, on those platforms than on Windows. I remember that because I was one of those people who played uh, World of Warcraft on uh, crossover gaming back then, or I think it was like it was just crossover. might have been it called have just... crossover office, but yeah, whatever it was, oh, I don't nice. remember the naming. It yeah, whatever the naming was, it's irrelevant. This is this is that time again. the The difference though is it's not just Linux enthusiasts. It's uh, getting getting these games, wanting to run their games on Linux with a roughly okay user experience to get it going. This is actually a piece of hardware that makes it approachable, makes it easy to just run a game. It's an appliance. My hope is is that Valve take another stab at a at the Steam Box. I, I think take the lessons learned. I really do feel like they took that the steam deck is the lessons learned it it made it very approachable made it really easy i i think it made it really easy to get linux in people's hands without a a huge barrier to entry which is the learning curve i don't care how much you make linux to to look like windows there's a learning curve it's different it's i don't i don't care if uh if there's a a menu that looks like the start menu. I don't care if they're you know an identical looking toolbar. Uh, it's still different, and so there's st- so there's still a barrier to entry. But with it, with this, it eliminates the barrier because it because it's a, an appliance. It abstracts it. So I want to see more of that. I want to see 
another Steam device, whether that's a deck version two or another crack at a Steam box or Steam machine. What I'm excited about here is that the technology stack on that Steam OS is KDE Plasma. And it's the it's it shows that KDE Plasma is totally a viable, competent, and excellent choice for a commercial Linux platform to use. Because there's just this this long, long thing where people say, oh yeah, KDE Plasma is just like not good for for enterprise or large scale commercial support or any of that sort of stuff. This is clearly bubkiss because Valve is proving that it's workable, if not workable, successful. And it has been shown people actually really do appreciate the KD Plasma experience at scale. And I think that shows that people should really rethink their opinions of whether KD Plasma is an environment that should be issued for commercial Linux. And I personally would like to see more usage of KD Plasma in commercial Linux environments. We'll see where how that goes, but that's my that's my hope and prayer here. I also like the fact that they built it on rolling release. I think it helps paint the f- rolling release in a very positive way that you don't have to have a set release cycle in order to have a good gaming platform. You can have it on a rolling system. Well, I think that I I would actually be careful about that because like one of the reasons why it's so successful is that uh, as a quote-unquote rolling release platform is because the person doing the rolling isn't you. It's Valve, right? So somebody's doing the rolling for you. And that's not actually that terribly different from, say, like Fedora Linux or um, OpenSUSE Leap or Ubuntu, right? Where they're centrally choosing when things roll forward rather than you just taking it as it comes from the interwebs. Like with Arch, you uh, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit, <laughs> right? It, uh, if you install a package, that, yeah, it may have tested green on, on the upstream CI, but whether if it works with all your component, with every other component you have, that's another story. I, I don't, I haven't used Arch in a long time in any meaningful way. Even when I was using it, it was for essentially 10 seconds in Linux time. I was using it. I think I used it for, I think overall about two weeks. My, what broke it for me was I didn't run updates every day. I finally decided to update one day and I had an unbootable system, but that's where, you know, valves there to, to obfuscate that, that from you, from the end user, that that's, that's what makes it, makes it so that arch can be used by it by the masses because there's someone doing the curation of the packages. It's not, uh, you're not just hitting update and hoping for the best. And the fact that it's transactional also helps. Right. The AB flipping is a very big deal because bad updates have happened. And the fact that they can safely flip back, that's a big deal. And that's really important. I have helped develop appliance, Linux based appliances. And I can tell you, there is no Linux-based appliance out there that has had any real staying power that doesn't have something like this. Because one bad update and your reputation is toast. In terms of Linux gaming, I think this year some other hardware did come out, uh, which is Intel Arc. And though some of the initial press has been, I'll call it, you know, it's an okay board if you use the, in this use case. And what's great about it is a lot of the, a lot of it in like in the window, like in windows land, they're using Vulcan to do all the translation down to direct X 11 and older. I believe it's direct X 11 or might be uh, like direct X 10 and older, but I'm pretty sure it's direct X 11 and older. But there, that's a huge advantage for us because on the Linux side, because uh, that's that's how we do things today. Is everything is translated through Vulkan? If my memory's right, 
I could be wrong there. Neil or Bill, correct me. But I'm pretty sure every all the translation for wine now goes through Vulcan versus uh, trying to re-engineer DirectX again. So it is still re-engineering Direct 3D through the video stack. But in Valve's distribution of wine, and we're going to call this distribution because that's really what it is, Proton is Valve's distribution of wine, and they bundle DXVK. DXVK translates D3D 12 APIs and D3D 11, D3D 10, and 9, and so on, to Vulkan. Wine, by default, translates them to OpenGL. But a lot of games now are D3D 12, and D3D 12 and Vulkan are very similar um, because they both descend from AMD's mantle. They have a much more similar programming model, and so it is a lot less lossy and it's a lot less expensive to do the translations from D3D to Vulkan than it is from D3D to OpenGL. thought you'd have a better memory on that than me. I, it's been a long time since I've had a... But I, I, I know a lot of the older games, It's they're a translation layer in Windows. And it, it, it reminded me of how it's done in Wine. It, it basically just uh, essentially has convinced me that... I, I actually just ordered a 770. So I'm gonna I wanna see how this see how it works, but my hope is, is to see better performance on gaming. I mean it's gonna be a might be equal or better to my current card, which is a first generation RDNA. But that's uh anyway, I'll see. I'll post something on it. We'll we'll figure I'll figure out something to talk about on that. Cause uh I don't game a lot, so I'll have to figure that one out. But the best part is, is that it's a four, it's an affordable GPU that is about half the price of of its competition. I think that the having a uh, an affordable, high performance GPU, because the the Arc is no slouch. It's certainly not the in the same class as say uh, a thirty eighty or a thirty ninety or an RX seventy nine hundred. It is what I think more people are going to want to reach towards as a reasonable choice for a mid-range graphics card. Because, you know, if you look at it, the average amount of money a gaming enthusiast is about is going to spend is somewhere on the round range of like eight hundred to to sixteen hundred dollars, and with that kind of budget. You you basically have two very expensive components you need to pay for, and then everything else has to fit around it, and that's the CPU and the GPU. And you know you don't want to skimp on power supply, so you got to put a lot of money towards that too. So then you got to have room for everything else. Having an affordable but powerful GPU like the Intel Arc makes it so enthusiasts want to build a good Linux gaming rig that has good performance at 1080p and 1440p, which are the common resolutions for gamers, totally can do it. And, like, I've heard that Intel's even working on making VR support work with Intel Arc and 3D and all these other things, right? So having all these capabilities built in to Intel Arc and making them available on Linux as first class, just like they have for all the other platforms, well, sole other platform, Windows, since Intel isn't for Macs anymore, that means that we're going to see gamers have a really good budget option that still gives them a good gaming experience. Because if you take Intel out of the picture, graphics cards at that price level suck. You have really, really bad binned, like low end GPUs from Intel, uh, from not from Intel, from AMD and NVIDIA, or you go back several generations to get something comparable in pricing. And so this is this is great because now people have something that they can afford to assemble. I was looking forward to your explanation of how you were going to figure out the whole Intel Arc series GPU onto the Mac Silicon CPU board. That's I thought maybe there was something incorporating Asahi Linux and Intel GPUs into Mac Silicon, but you took the wind out of my sails. Well, look, man, if in, if Apple decides to make eGPU through Thunderbolt, through USB 4 work on any of these things, then we'll talk. As far as I'm aware, right now, that's not a thing, even for macOS. Never mind 
Linux or anything else. You like the hardware literally can't drive a GPU. Just just to drive home the point, I'm just I'm looking at a probably its closest competitor in terms of performance. The Intel Arc is GeForce, yeah, thirty sixty or thirty seventy. But you have to go go down to the the thirty sixty. And then you're within price striking distance, depending on which board partner you go with uh, and the amount of RAM. And it's about $369 and Intel Arc is a $350 for the, for the reference board, for the Intel reference board. Right. And Intel, Intel has board partners too. And that means that the prices could, be, uh, could vary in either a positive or a negative direction, depending on how you look at it. The only one that's cheaper than that from NVIDIA is the 3050, and I wouldn't touch that card with a five-foot pole. <laughs> right? And, like, on the AMD side, I think the closest is the RX 6600 XT. And, like, that thing, I wouldn't recommend it. If if your choice is the RX 6600 XT or the ARC A7, uh, A750, just buy the A750. It's a better card. You're going to get more out of it. Oh, and we forgot about the superpower of the Arc GPUs. AV1. AV1. Yeah. AV1 encoding. Yeah. Encoding so, and decoding. I know. Right. It, correct. It, yeah. It does both. And that's a big deal because every GPU in its price bracket right now does not support either. RDNA 2 supports decoding. Not on the 6600 XT. It's not there. They right, well, actually... They we'll double check have... that and put it in the show notes. Yeah. Right. So yeah. like my understanding is that the the RDNA 2 GPUs that are in the price class actually have the video encoding and decoding parts ripped right out, not supported. And so same goes for the NVIDIA side. Yeah, the, in, on NVIDIA and on AMD, only the latest generation supports encoding and decoding. And those things are in the thousand dollar price tier, so it's ridiculous. Maybe I just need to do it, have my have an Intel Arc as a coprocessor. I mean, we're going all the way back to the '90s where we had FPUs and coprocessors. Like, sure, why not? Right? Hey, I have the PCI lanes. I can do it. But sure. Not, it's not like we're using does. them for anything. Not like we're using them for anything else anymore. I literally built this system that I'm using right now to record the show with you guys, spec'd out to include an Intel Arc GPU later on. That's oh, good. Be fun. My car, my uh, my uh, system can support, I think, three GPUs. So What? Wow, that's a lot. This allows Brandon to run an NVIDIA card, an AMD card, and an Intel card all at the same time, so he can pick and choose his poison whenever he wants. I wouldn't do that. I want, I, I, uh, I like, I don't need a, that high of an electric bill. <laughs> Are you sure? I mean, like, you make the big bucks, dude. <laughs> I think we should ask the listeners out there who wants to see Brandon run three video cards in one rig. Actually, is there even a PSU out there that can take that kind of power draw? Because, like, the if we if, if you look at the, like... Let's say he does a 3090, or no, a 4090. He does a 4090, and he does an RX 7950 XTX, and he does a ARC A770. I think you basically pull the max power draw of a of a of of the highest end power supplies sold in the United States. I disagree, because we in our company build render rigs for a few clients, and we have built systems that had four 2080 TIs. The limitation oh was not the power supply that we found 1600 and 2000 watt power supplies. The limitation is the electrical outlet in the wall oh. where you need a dedicated 20 amp circuit to run such a monster. Oh, I'm sure Brandon has 20 amp circuits floating around his house. I have a dedicated circuit just for my office. That's a different story. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do have an NVIDIA graphics card, but it's an older Quadro. So I can just toss that in there. I have a, I have a question about that card, Brandon. Is that covered under the new NVIDIA open source drivers that were released fairly recently for Red Hat? I don't know. I'd have to look into it. But the that's actually something that was really interesting from this year 
I never thought I'd see NVIDIA open source a thing. I, you weren't, I was blown away. And like, I, like I had an inkling of thinking that it might happen someday because of reasons when it, when it actually happened, it's like, how in the world did this happen? The implications of it are interesting and I'm hoping to see more work around it, especially for getting, getting Linux support sooner. In a way it makes sense for NVIDIA to do this. I mean, this is not on the gaming side. This is more on the AI ML side, you know, bit, you know, business workloads that need GPUs that use data center GPUs. They essentially use the same silicon. They actually do have the same code for their drivers. Just, you know, some of it, just the different, the main differences is essentially turning features on or off or allowing you to have access to features on the silicon. So it's a, uh, something interesting i'd like to see just support for nvidia graphics cards sooner i don't necessarily i may not necessarily buy one but if it makes it easier for me to use one well uh, that you know it, it's just more hardware options for me as far as i look at that i mean if you, if you look at like what pc lap like laptop owners are the ones that are super screwed by the nvidia thing because for the last what 5 years when was the last time you saw like a decent, like not really low end laptop come with anything other than an NVIDIA GPU? Because I, I, even on the Apple side, like only the only reason Apple Macintosh computers, the Intel ones, had AMD GPUs is because Apple and NVIDIA got into a tiff in 2012. And then, and then they decided, you know, no more. But like every other PC maker has been happily stuffing NVIDIA GPUs into those laptops for years and years and years. So from my perspective, I think this is going to be great because all those people who have this hardware that they don't really have a choice in can finally use it properly without pain, maybe someday. Right now, I'm just hoping that AMD keeps it up with uh, the progress on their uh, Zen for on their Zen architecture and uh, makes it viable, uh, keeps it viable as an alternative platform for for pcs because uh, i i picked up an x13 amd because the reviews on on amd chips on the on amd 6000 series uh cpus along with their integrated gpus versus the equivalent generation intel is essentially intel turns into turns into a hot plate whereas amd system is keeps relatively cool or the big my big hope you know looking into next year is more arm support one of the things i would love to be able to do is buy the uh, thinkpad x13s which is a arm based system and be able to get fedora uh, linux installed on it but one of the things i'm also looking forward to mostly because of the raspberry pi shortage um, i've needed a few of those for projects that i've been working on Instead, I've ended up buying either uh, uh, Rock Pros from Pine, or uh, or something, or or some other board. But the but I'm really looking forward to more support for Rock Chip thirty five eighty eight, which is the latest higher performing chip from uh, that will be put into next generation Pine uh, sixty four boards. That's uh, also currently in the the rock five board and uh the turing pi too they're looking at shipping compute modules with uh, that same chip as well since i bought a turing pi too i really want support for <laughs> uh those that that chip set uh for uh you know for pure selfish reasons but that that's uh my uh my big hope for next year is better arm support. I still think x86 is, uh, my opinion, x86 is the better consumer platform in terms of choice, you know, allowing consumers to be able to use the operating system they want. It's just take take time with arm. It's just going to be a much harder road. It, it's a, I, just am, I just don't want it to look like 1999 all over again. I think it would be nice to see a chip come out like that 3588 
which the entire thing on a board is probably the size of an old Socket 7 K62450 from 1999. I want Slockets to come back. I want Slocketed Arms. Are, Slocketed are you, Arms. Are you talking about like the Slot 1 Pentium 2s? Yes, like those. I was just talking to one of my technicians about that yesterday, explaining the concept oh. of it, and his eyes went as big as dinner plates, thinking that a processor came in a card. Well, so so did power PC uh, CPUs for like years on um, from like a lot of the old world Macs. They got power PC upgrades by like slotting in a card to 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 actually put in a new CPU. That was a thing that ran up all the way up until two thousand. Like I, I remember seeing this. Oh, Gosh, I don't remember who made them. It's this really lovely, like, purple G4 upgrade CPU card. Matrox? No, not Matrox. That was GPU. No, it's like this PowerPC G4 upgrade that was like... They look yeah. different than the Pentium, but they were... But they... I do... I've seen, like, the upgrade modules for PowerPC laptops and, yeah. uh, and for desktops, but they were essentially, like... It looked like... Um, it actually looks a, a lot like a GPU does. Today. Like a or uh, no, it looked more like a like a like a Raspberry Pi CM4 type ah, thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, it, uh, that's what it looked like. Uh, Although they had the, the big heat sink strapped on. But, them yeah, and then the Pentium one looked more like a. That's the one that looked more like a like a PCI slot. Yeah, you know, that, that and I think I remember some. I, I think I had a friend that uh, took his computer apart and accidentally put something in there that he shouldn't have. Oh, yay. Those are fun. <laughs> <laughs> Fourth yeah, of July like, unintentionally. Yeah, like I would love to see. If we're going to go down this ugly road of having the CPUs soldered onto the motherboards now, because like I've had a couple of ARM server boards, prototypes, commercial boards, whatever. And one thing that's in common for all of them is that the CPU is not removable or upgradable. So if we're going to go down this road of having ARM show up everywhere, I want upgrade CPUs. I want to be able to upgrade the CPU. Give me a way to do it. Either socketed, LGA or BGA or whatever. I don't care. Or if you want to go the fun route, make it a daughter card. Just just give me upgrade cards and let me slot them in like I did with with power PCs and old Intels. Neil, earlier you talked about Plasma being so awesome. I think every single time I get you to talk about Plasma, you uh, either A, try to convince me to use it, or B, you, do, you just go off on how awesome it is just uh, in general, not just trying to convince me to use, convincing me to use it. So next year is likely going to be Plasma 6, which... I'm guessing is going to be based on QT6. That's the general idea. The idea is, so Plasma 6 isn't itself supposed to be super special. It's more of the same, just on a newer toolkit. I think the biggest refinement we're going to see is that the Wayland session stuff is just going to be miles better. It's pretty good now in Plasma 526 and the upcoming 527, which is the plan to be the last Plasma 5 release. A lot of improvements and re-architecting and stuff like that that's gone on into Qt Wayland, which underpins all of Plasma's Wayland support, basically only happened in Qt 6. Some of it got backported to Qt 5, but a lot of it stayed only in Qt 6. And so a lot of goodies are going to come to us once we've switched over. And so that's what I'm excited about. Is like moving over to Qt 6 means we get a lot more modern architecture within the rendering pipeline for Qt, everything can become hardware accelerated as we need to. Vulkan and stuff becomes a lot easier to use throughout the whole thing. We get enhanced multimedia and portability and all this other fun stuff that makes, that reinforces that Plasma is the best desktop environment to build anything on top of. The best technology stack built on the most performant toolkit that you could get in the open source world. But most of it's not going to be stuff people are going to see. What I think people are going to see is the features that people will start adding on top of it to take advantage of systems integrations and things like that that are going on. Like, for example, I've been doing a, a fair bit of work talking about what we can take advantage of in KDE with, with some of the um, technologies that we have in Fedora, like ButterFS. Um, we have transparent compression. 
we have sub volumes and like one of the one of the things I'm hoping for in trying to figure out is like how can we start using Butterfest features more effectively in a desktop context? Like for example, doing transparent full disk encryption from a system that was previously initialized without any encryption at all. How can we do stuff like managing a selective encryption for things with different keys, different passwords, different users, whatever? How can we do all these kinds of things? And this is going to be a real challenge of integrating with the desktop stack down to the plumbing layers. And Butterfest native encryption, which is something that has a patch set up for review, there's been a design discussion, there's some improvements coming down the pipeline. My, my, my expectation is that we're going to see Butterfest native encryption land next year, maybe in the, in the first half of next year. And once that happens, I want to start seeing what we can do to bring that into the desktop and make that a first class feature that people can really take advantage of at the same level that like you look at a Mac and you've got File Vault. You look on, on a Windows PC and you have BitLocker. I want the same kind of quality and integration with Fedora KDE that you can get on those platforms. And I, I truly believe that with Butterfest, we'll be able to get there with the Butterfest native encryption. There's a lot of other things that we could also do. Like I, as a longtime Mac user as well, have unabashedly adored Time Machine. I want Time Machine on Linux. I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I want it. I was just thinking about that as you were talking about the encryption piece of it. Wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of ButterFS snapshot send to some sort of external device, whether it's a NAS, an external drive, removable drive, whatever have you, but having some sort of mechanism built into the desktop to be able to do that, I think would be very, very helpful. One of the things that's part of this that um, most people wouldn't probably get from the get-go is those features can be combined. So you could do things like, okay, you have a volume that is encrypted. You take snapshots of it. You do a Butterfest send of that volume. That volume does not have to be decrypted to be transmitted. It is sent fully blind to the other end. And so that gives you security at rest and security in transit. That's fantastic. Like there are very, very few ways for you to pull that off in ordinary circumstances. Having that, having a way to do that built into Linux is a big deal. It, this is something that you and I have talked about a lot. Being able to not just have that level of experience where I only type in one password. Like with Lux today, I need to type in a, an encryption key and then type in my user password to just to log into my laptop making it more seamless. I think that's the the new issue with Linux is not having that seamless experience like Windows and, and Mac, specifically around data encryption. And, and I think that uh, does hinder adoption, whether if that's uh, for personal use or for uh, enterprise use. No one wants to type in a password twice. We have a lot to look forward to next year. I think this year has been an interesting year I mean, we have a lot of things happening we didn't even get into people are nicknaming the tech winter hopefully it's a short one and hopefully the tech conferences help turn some of that around because that's where a lot of the selling happens that gets uh you know that keeps them hiring and keeps them moving and we got a lot of technology to look forward to and we'll cover that periodically throughout the year as it makes sense Bill, Neil, thank you for joining me again. I am very excited that we're going to keep working on this show next year together as a team. Hopefully getting back onto the every other Thursday rhythm. But if not, you'll catch us when we release. Thank you for listening to The Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. Mm -hmm.